Good morning, Generations Church. What a what a night we had last night. Stand up. We're going to continue with that same fire we had last night. Spend a little time thanking God this morning. Come on. Yeah. Wandering into the night. Wanting a place to hide this weary soul.
before before we go into the next song here, um, I just wanted to take a little time to just kind of get our, our hearts right for this song. Um, so I woke up this morning and I was feeling, I was feeling good. I wasn't feeling bad or anything like that, but I was feeling very uh, grateful. And I was just sitting like right after, you know, we're getting, getting up to come back here after worship night and everything. And, you know, my spirit was still there. <laughs> and um, I was just, I just got up and I sat up and I was just kind of sitting in with the Lord. And, and I just kind of sat there for a moment. And I just took a moment between him and I. And I was just sitting there. I was like, oh, wow. I get to worship you. Like, it is such a privilege to be able to worship God. And I know sometimes we can take that for granted because, you know, we've always lived in this, this period where we can just come to God whenever we want. Um, we don't have to go through all of the the sacrificing of the animals and having to have someone go in, you know, to the Holy of Holies for us because if we went in, you know, we die, you know, like that kind of thing. We don't have to worry about, you know, um, all of the, the, the rituals and all the things that it took just to be and stand in the presence of God. And now that because of what Jesus did, we can come to him whenever Sometimes however we want, however we show up, <laughs> we are able to just come and sit at his feet and be in his presence and him allowing, you know, just him showing us his glory and showing us his face. And I don't know, I just want us to take a moment and just really take that in at the fact that the God of all gods, the alpha and the omega, the beginning and the end, allows us in our sin and in our iniquity and in our mess to come to him and just and to be in his presence. So as we go on into this next song, it's called Nothing Else We Know It. But I know sometimes we can take that for granted. And I just want us to be able to take this moment and to recenter our focus on God and say, God, I'm sorry. I'm sorry for, for taking, being able to come to you and to talk to you and to be in your presence for granted. I'm sorry for just singing whatever song that comes to my mind without referencing the fact that what I'm, who I'm singing to is you. to remember that you are all that I need and you are enough. So as we go on to this next song, um, I just want us to sing to him and to really sing to him. Say I'm sorry when I've just 
just gone through the motions, I'm sorry When I just sing another song, take me back to where we start I'm sorry, and I've come with my agenda. I'm sorry, when I forgot that you're enough. Take me back to where we start. I open up my heart to you. So caught up in your presence, caught up in your presence.
Let's give it up for the worship team this morning, you guys. Thank you so much for leading us this morning. My name is Pastor Adam, and if I have not met you, we're getting ready to jump into the message here in just a second. But before we do that, I want to put a couple of things on your radar. Generations Church is 
fitting to have a birthday, all right? I don't know if you're aware of that, but our four-year anniversary is not next week. It is the week after that. It's going to be February 11th. We've got a really cool service planned, and so that is a, a service you're going to want to make sure you are a part of. Um, if you know anybody that ain't been to church in a while and they've been part of the life of Generation Church, it's a great Sunday to invite them back, things like that. So we are excited. That is coming up. We hope to see you guys there for that. Also, Scott's getting ready to throw up a slide on the back that's got some small group information. We've got small groups getting ready to kick off. There it is. Bam. So we got some small groups that are getting ready to start. We've got a, a small group in Locust Grove that's going to meet Wednesday nights at 7. That's going to be at my house. I'm a little biased, but I'm pretty sure that's going to be the best group. We also have a group that's going to be meeting in Fayetteville. That's going to be on Thursday nights at 7. Stockbridge in Tuesday or on, on Tuesday at 7 as well. So if you are interested in getting plugged into one of those small groups, you can grab the connection card that is in the seat in front of you. You can fill that out, and that will be a way that you can express your interest in being a part of one of those small groups, all right? And if you are unfamiliar with our connection card, I just want to take a second. This thing right here is uh, kind of your first stop, okay? If, if you have something you want to communicate with us, if you have a prayer request, if there's something um, going on in your life, if you're interested in being baptized, if you need to talk to somebody, if there's anything like that, this is a great place to start that, okay? If you're looking to join a team, if you're looking to give, all that stuff is on this connection card, all right? So if you've got a prayer request, do us a favor and grab that, fill that out before you leave, drop it in the bucket on your way out. If you're signing up for a small group, grab it, fill it out, drop it in the bucket on your way out. If you need to talk to somebody, if you're trying to join a team, grab it, fill it out, drop it in the bucket on your way out. Sound good? Awesome, awesome, awesome. Again, we got those QR codes. One of them on the top there is for our giving. How many of you guys want to be a church that impacts the community around us? Yeah, that sounds like something everybody's on board with. All right, I see lots of clapping. All right. Can I be a pastor for a minute? Is that all right? If we want to be a church that impacts the community around us, we cannot expect other people to fund that for us. Can we just be honest, right? If, if we're going to impact the community around us, that's going to require us as a church being a church that gives with the radical generosity that we say that we uh, want to walk out, okay? So if you are somebody who does not tithe, if you're somebody who is not regularly giving, I'm not coming for you, but I do want to encourage you to consider that, right? Maybe seek the Lord, ask him what he would have you do. If, if giving is something that is new to you and you want to have a conversation, we're here for that, right? Come find me. Come find one of our pastors. Come find one of our leaders. There are people who would love to walk you through the journey that we have had with giving to prove to you in a very tangible way that God keeps his promises when he says to test me in this. Amen? All right, so if we're going to be a church that reaches the community around us, we also have to be a church that gives, all right? So I'm going to go ahead and pray for us really quickly. Pastor Chris is going to come up, and he's got a word for us this morning. So, Father, we love you. God, we ask that you would just continue to be with us this morning, God. As Pastor Chris comes, Lord, we ask that you would just impress upon us what you have for us this morning, God. We know that you brought us here because there's something you want to say to us, God. There's a way in which you want to challenge us and shape us and change us, God. And Lord, we just say right now, in this moment, this morning, God, we are listening, we are available, and we are ready. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen, 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 amen. Give Jesus a big hand this morning. Yeah. Normally we have you walk around and shake hands, but the Spirit was here this morning, and, and I have a hard time finishing on time as it is, so we're just going to dive in this morning. You guys ready? Yes. You ready? Yes. Let's start with a survey. You ready? Yes. A little survey. You ready? Yes. Okay, let me ask you this. What is the most likely thing to kill you? You got four options. You ready? Having six drinks of alcohol a day. That was A. B, obesity. C, smoking 15 cigarettes a day. Or D, loneliness. Which one do you think it is? You guys are really smart. Loneliness. So you were created to be in the presence of people. There's something deep inside of your soul that just longs for the presence of God. You need God in your life. And we've been going through this series this month that we're, we've started. This is a year of presence as a church because we were all created 
to be in the presence of God. But not only that, we are all created to be in the presence of people. You can't live life on your own. You can't live life isolated and independent. You, we need each other. The second week of the series, we talked about, we, you know, we, we, we really want to have biblical days in these day and time. And we looked at Acts 2 and how the people came together daily and they were devoted to the apostles' teaching and coming together and breaking the bread of one another. You know what? You know how you can have biblical times on the earth today? We just start doing the things that are in the Bible, living the things that are in the Bible. If we would actually do that, but we were created to be with people. Because I don't know about you, Mario makes me better. <laughs> People that hang around us collectively as a team, they know that. I'm kind of focused on the goal, and, and sometimes I get people, like I love them, but I'm trying to make them better, and that's how I'm trying to show them I love them, but it don't always, always translate that way. But we need each other to rub on each other and improve each other and make each other better. And then last week we talked about, well, that was about community was the second week. Last week we talked about being with people. And like Jesus was with people. Jesus had time. When he was on his way, he would go out of his way to go encounter people and get in their life. When he went through Samaria, the Bible says he had to go through Samaria. Samaria was just, Samaria was, he didn't want to go that way, but he had to go that way because there was a person there that needed to meet him. And we need to be people that when we come around people who are hurting and struggling we need to take the time to slow down when they brought the adulterous woman to him Jesus had something else to do but he took the time to sit there and, and sow into her and show her that she mattered we were created to be with Jesus and so I want to finish this series out this morning we're going to look at Exodus I think we've been in the New Testament all month. We're going to go back to the Old Testament. How about that for finishing that? We're going to go to Exodus 3, verses 1 through 10. I'm reading out the New King James Version, which generally that's what I'm reading out of, just so you know. Now Moses was tending the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian, and he led the flock to the back of the desert. And he came to Horeb, the mountain of God, and the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame a fire from the midst of the bush. So he looked, and behold, the bush was burning with fire, but the bush was not consumed. Then Moses said, I will now turn aside and see this great sight, why this bush does not burn out. How many, times, how, how many people catch on fire for the Lord sometimes, and then you just turn around every, a few minutes later, and it just burns straight out? How many want to burn like this bush for Jesus? So when the Lord saw that he turned aside to look, God called him from the midst of the bush, and he said, Moses, Moses. And he said, Here I am. Then he said, Do not draw near this place. Take off your sandals. Take your sandals off your feet, for the place where you stand is holy ground. Moreover, he said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look upon God. And the Lord said, I have surely seen the oppression of my people who are in Egypt and have heard their cry because of their taskmasters, for I know their sorrows. So I've come to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians and, say and, and. to bring them up from that land to a good and large and flowing, a land flowing with milk and honey, to the place of the Can Canaanites and the Hittites and the Amorites and the Perizzites and the Hivites and the Jebusites and all the ites. Now, therefore, behold, the cry of the children of Israel has come to me, and I have also seen the oppression with which the Egyptians oppressed them. Come now. Say, come now. Come now. Therefore, and I will send you to Pharaoh, that you may bring my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. I want to talk this morning from this topic, presence in the gap. Jesus, we come to you grateful that you are a God who has put vision and purpose in all of our lives. I pray that this morning that you will open our ears and our minds and our hearts to, to really understand how we can relate to one another, how we can relate with ourselves, how we can relate with you in the moments where it seems like nothing is happening. 
in the moments where it seems like the promise is, is just out there somewhere in the distance and there's no way to come to it, help us how to understand how to live in the gap. Holy Spirit, come this morning and ignite something in us that cannot be put out. In Jesus' name, amen. Give my boy a big hand over here. I love him. He's hobbling today. His foot's hurting him. How many married folk out there? I got a few. How many, how many want to be married? You want to be married? You're already married. <laughs> Okay, sorry, right, sorry. Right. Yes. Sometimes, sometimes. <laughs> the hardest part about communication. Are y'all ready? The hardest part about communication is assuming that it actually happens. And so, how many of you guys are not married, but want to be married? You got a couple of you out there? All right, married folk, watch this. In their minds right now, they've got this picture of what it's going to look like. <laughs> it's going to be good. The guys got one thing in their minds. Girls have another. But in our minds, we have this picture of how great this marriage is going to be. It's going to be sunshine and roses. It's going to be honeymoon all the time. Come on, guys. It's just going to be good. And then... <laughs> You get married, and it goes good, the honeymoon's good, it's good, and then you get home, the honeymoon's still good, and then something happens. It doesn't take long, and, and then all of a sudden, this picture that you had in your mind, this great picture of how it was going to look, of how it was going to feel to be married to this person, that you were, all of a sudden, it doesn't look like you thought it looked or how it was going to look. It doesn't feel how you thought it was going to feel. I had Becca bring me some puzzles in this morning. And uh, Lori gave me these, by the way. See, oftentimes our lives look like this picture right here. Isn't it really good? That's a nice-looking tower. It's calling us home. I mean, you can get spiritual with it if you wanted to. But this is the picture that we see of our lives, and then we turn around and God hands us a bag of pieces. Yeah. And, 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 and you're going, oh my goodness. I'm sorry, you lose the puzzle pieces. That's all right. <laughs> but you got this picture <laughs> that looks really good, and you turn around <laughs> and you're going, oh my God. Like, have you ever tried to put pieces together sometimes? All right, Lori. Wait, it wasn't this puzzle. Me and, me and Becca put a puzzle together a few weeks ago, and I worked really hard on that thing, and I got to the end of it, and I realized I had some pieces in the wrong spot. You know what I did? I put it back in the box. I tore it up and put it back in the box. But oftentimes, you get this picture of what your life should look like, but then you turn around, and it looks like this. It looks broken. It looks like it's in pieces. Moses had this picture of God. God told him he wanted to go and he wanted to help him bring the people out of the land of Egypt, bring them out of slavery, bring them out of bondage. And Moses says, at first Moses said, you need to go get somebody else because I can't talk, I can't do any of this. And then finally God convinced him against his will to go and do this thing for God. And, and Moses goes out and he begins to talk to the Pharaoh. And what happens? Anybody know? It's a dialogue. It don't have to be a monologue. You can talk back to him. It's good. Not only did the Pharaoh turn them down, the slaves that were out there making these bricks and things, he said, all right, now we're no longer going to supply you with hay. You're going to have to go out and you're going to have to get your own hay and you're going to have to, but your quota's not going down. You're still going to have to produce like you were producing. And then Moses, here's what it says in Moses 5, or Exodus 5, 22 to 23. It says, Moses turned to the Lord God and said, Lord, why have you brought this trouble on these people? Why is it that you've sent me? For since I came to Pharaoh to speak in your name, he has done evil to these people. And neither have you delivered your people at all. See, God told Moses to go in and do something. God gave Moses a picture of something that, that was going to be great that he was going to do, do for him. But before it got better, it got a whole lot worse. Can you relate to that in your own life? 
Like how many times has God put a picture in your, a vision of something in, in front of you and then you go chasing after it and then all of a sudden as you start moving that way it all goes. I remember when we did the build out in this church. I never done anything like that before. I was so frustrated by the time we launched this church that my first message was on frustration. That's a, that's a message. Maybe that would have been a message from, that was a word from the Lord because we were five weeks away from frustration at the time. Come on. God can work through the problems that he puts in you. It's like Adam said last night. He goes, I don't know what the Lord, I was trying to figure out something to tell you, but God said, hey, just tell him what I'm, deal, what I'm dealing with in you right now. See, it's easy to look at scripture and go, because we can recite that. We all know the story of Exodus, the Israelites coming out of the land. We all know the story of Abraham. We all know the story of Noah. We all know the story of the disciples. And it's easy to sit here and look at that and go, oh, it's so cute because we have perspective. We're looking back on it. They were living it. <laughs> See, they didn't know they were the main characters in the book at the time that it was going through. They didn't know. Moses had no clue that the Red Sea was going to part. Moses had none of those ideas. So we have the ability to look back and see it now. But isn't this how it works? Yes. It's not just with Moses. You think of Abraham. Yes. God called Abraham to go out and go to a new land. He was going to take him to this place. The land flowing milk and honey. Still the same land. And he was going, Abraham was calling him there. And then he told him he was going to have a son. Problem. He was 85. He was 75 when God called him to go out. He was 85 when God called him that he was going to have a son. And then what happened in the middle when nothing was happening? He took measures in on his hand. He's going to help God. Matter of fact, all the stuff you see going on in the Middle East right now comes directly from that moment right there. And I lost my train of thought. <laughs> But in the gap, what are you going to do? Moses was 85. You know how old he was when Isaac was born? 100. 100 year old. 25 years. 10 from the time, or 25 from the time he was supposed to go. 15 before he got the promise. David. Think of David. David was out there in 1 Samuel 16. He was out there playing on the backside of the hill. He wasn't even invited to the party for the anointing. And God chose him to be the next king. What did David do? He went back and started tending the sheep on the backside of the desert. It was 16 years before he ascended the throne and became king. What did he do in the meantime? He served Saul, the man that was trying to kill him. What do you do in the promise gap? When the thing that God has promised you doesn't seem to be happening, what do you do? Do you serve like David did? Or... <laughs> Let's just be honest. If you're like me, you complain. You know, God, you promised me something, and it hasn't happened yet. What do you do? I'm going to give you a few things you can do, you should do in the process. I was reading one article that this guy wrote. He said, you should live without holding your breath. See, oftentimes in our lives, we get stuck somewhere because it's like we're standing where we are in this moment, holding our breath, praying that God will do something about it, and we live exhausted and frustrated. Just hold your breath for about 10 minutes. Or don't do that, you'll die. <laughs> hold your breath for about 15 seconds, and you'll be like, oh, my goodness. But live without holding your breath. Just live. Breathe deep. Take on the things of God because here's what we know. We know that whatever God has promised us in life, it will come to pass. It will come to pass in his timing, in his way, and for his glory. Here's the thing about God. God is rarely early. He's never late, but he's always on time. Right. Yeah. Second Corinthians says this, For all the promises of God and in God and him are yes and amen to the glory of God. So the first thing we need to do is we need to trust God and we need to wait. 
on his promise. Don't do like Abraham and go take matters into your own hands. I'm going to tell you that, but you're going to do it anyway. But we shouldn't. We need to trust God. Wait patiently. And you can't speed up God's promise in your life. Have you ever tried? You've tried. But when you begin trying, don't you just end up miserable? Don't you just end up frustrated with life? Don't you just end up in this loop and you you got this language going on in your head because it's not happening fast enough and you just got these stories that are going on and, and we just need to wait patiently and trust God. The second thing you need to do is this. Write down the promise. Are there things God has promised you that he's told you is going to happen? Are, are they written down or are they in your head? Because here's the thing. When you take time, they say there's something about taking something out of your head and just writing it on pen and paper that makes it all the more likely for you to see it come through. Just by taking that little step. The Bible says this in Habakkuk 2.2. 2, it says, write down the vision and make it plain so that a herald may run with it. You know why we don't see much going on sometimes in the church world? Because things aren't clear. We don't understand why we're here often. We have competing visions. When God's called us to one thing, we're trying to do many things. The Bible says, write down the vision and make it plain so that a herald may run with it. Could you imagine what it would be like if we were all out on a lake? You ever see those rowboat races? And some of us were paddling this way, and the other ones were paddling the opposite way. How fast would we get somewhere? <laughs> but if you ever watch those Olympic rowers, they just get out there, and it is just flying. They're all in sync. They're synced together. And, and they're going fast. But it's the synergy of all their efforts going and rowing in the same direction that does it. The Bible also says this. It says, where there is no vision... This is in Proverbs 29. It says, where there is no vision, people cast off restraint. Where there is no vision, people perish. Where there is no vision, people cast off restraint. In other words, when you have no vision, you're not going to do the things that you need to do. Because sometimes to get to the place where God is calling to you, it's going to take some sacrifice. But if you can't see it, you're going to cast off the restraints to keep you in line with where God is calling you. In, in uh, the message version, it says this. When people can't see what God is doing, they stumble all over themselves. But when they attend to what he has revealed, they are most blessed. So we're in the gap. We're in that promise gap. God's promised us something, but we're in the middle, and it doesn't seem like it's happening. We need to trust God and wait on him. We need to write down the promise. And you need to put it somewhere you can see it so you can remind yourself. Life has a way, the enemy has a way of lying to you. The enemy has a way of making you forget the things that God has told you. That's why you need to write it down so you can put it on your mirror in your bathroom. Put it where you work so you can remind yourself of what God is calling you to. And then the next thing is this. Well, hang on, let me back up. I was about to, I was about to skip a few things. Hang on. I'm, I, I, I'm obsessed with getting all my notes on Two pages, so I had this in like 10 fonts, so I didn't really see it because I'm blind when I look down right here. See, we're a church that's called to know Jesus, grow in Jesus, to go make a difference for Jesus. And what that really means, so let's make it clear. Y'all ready? We're here to see lost people found. In other words, we want to see lost people come to know Jesus. But we don't want to see them sit right there. Once they come to know Jesus, we want to see found people pastored. We want to see people who have found Jesus begin to deal with the issues of their life. By the way, if you're sucking air right now, you still got some issues. Don't think you ever arrived because that's when you backslide. But we want to see found people pastored. But once people began to find healing in their life, we want to see these pastored people discipled, yeah. become, start becoming the people that God has called them to be. And then as we become discipled people who begin looking like Jesus, acting like Jesus, we want to see people go out and make a difference for Jesus. What does that look like? That means when you're cleaning teeth at the dentistry for children, or is it dentistry? It is dentistry. I can't remember. That you're just doing it for Jesus. 
And when you get those families, sometimes you get some people, you're like, man, God. You just love them. You don't judge them. You talk, uh, talk up to them, not down to them. You talk to them like Jesus would. People don't need to be told what to do. I heard one somebody say, and you guys might know this, it's love, not guilt and shame that has the power to change a person. But we want to see people know Jesus and grow in Jesus. So I, how many of you guys have been doing the fast with us, 21 days of prayer? God told you anything over the 21 days? I'm going to tell you what God told me. He reminded me of something he told me four year, five years ago. Up in Dahlonega, I was hanging out with Mario. You can come on up. Uh, Lamonte. I was leading this. It was kind of like a prayer service where people were dealing with issues and, you know, getting rid of things because we all got things in us. And I was leading this uh, service. And it was a time where you could just come up and, and find somebody. You had something to pray with some people up front of the room. Kind of like an altar moment with people in it. And I had like four pastors up there with me. And I was like, all right, if you need something, if you need to get over something, come on. You can just share with these people. They'll pray with you. They'll be here with you. And, and I was standing there in the middle <laughs> trying to be in the gap for them. I, but... I was just standing there in that place, a few pastors here, a few pastors there, and, and they began coming up to people, and I was just standing there, and nobody came to me. I'm leading the service, and I'm just standing there, and I kind of got up, and I walked to the back of the room, kind of like those doors that are back there, and I just stood there in the back of the room and I just began to watch the spiritual environment that was going on and kind of just see what the Lord was doing in that moment and in that moment as I was sat there in that moment the Lord told me this this is how you lead your church and what he reminded me of over these past 21 days is this See, we're looking for a breakthrough. We're looking for something to happen. We're looking for the doors to swing right open. And God said, no, 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 no. The promise is in the people. Amen. See, what God is going to do here in this place, in this city, in this area, in your lives, and out of this church, it's, it's in you. See, my job isn't to sit here and try to, to, to fix everything and, and hold everything. My, my job is to look at you and say, hey, there is something in you that you do not see. And my job is to stand here and call the thing out of you that, see, here's the thing. I would have never thought I was a preacher in my whole life. I'm quiet. I don't say much. But there was a man that's sitting in the second row right there that used to always walk up to me and say, hey, God's got something on you. He's like, I don't know what it is. He goes, it's, like, it's like Clark Kent and Superman. It's like you're like Clark Kent and then you step on the platform and then somebody else comes out. My dad used to tell me, he goes, I don't know what it is. It's like when you preach, it's not even you because it's not. This is my gift. Amen. But there's gifts in you. There's gifts in this church that aren't being fully utilized. Just think of what, I mean, I don't know how many people in this room, but there's, there's more than Jesus had when he left. There was 12 there. And he took that gospel from Jerusalem to Judea to Samaria to the ends of the earth in one generation. Yes, he did. Out of less people that are in this room. Let's stop sitting around thinking about what God hadn't done. <laughs> While we're sitting here in this gap that we're in, uh, instead of complaining, instead of, instead of getting frustrated, I do this myself. I, get, I, I ask Adam, I get frustrated because I'm that guy that wants to pursue excellence. Matter of fact, here's a conversation. 
Sometimes Mario and Adam get uncomfortable in our staff meetings with me and Becca. Because me and Becca will go at each other. But it's because we're looking for an answer. It's not personal. Matter of fact, the kids' room looks like that right now because of an argument we had. The hall was going to go all the way to the end, and she got so mad. And I was like, all right. And I woke up one morning, and I saw that room. But it came out of us pushing at each other. But we were having a conversation. I don't know. It's been about two months ago now. And they all three were coming at me. Because I was saying, we love God. We love people. We pursue excellence. And I'm all about excellence. But I'm harder on myself than I am anybody else. But they kept going out. I was like, we got to fix this. We got to do that. Do that. Mario goes, yeah, but if all you're focused on is that, what happens to the loving people? That's why you got people in your life. You got to have people in your life that can say things to you. You got to have people in your life that can take the risk to tick you off. To make you better. The promise is in the people. The promise is in you. Here we are. What are we going to do? We're going to trust God and wait on Him? We're going to Write it down. Here's the last thing. You have to be obedient now. Let me go back and show you something in that scripture that I saw as I was preparing for this. God was going to take Moses, to, and this is what we know, he's going to lead these people to a land flowing with milk and honey, right? Yeah. Let's go look at that. So let's, I'll go back. I don't know what verse it is because I don't have the verses written down. It says, And the Lord said, I have surely seen the oppression of my people who are in Egypt and have heard their cry because of their taskmasters, for I know their sorrows. So I have come to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them up from the land to a good and large land flowing with milk and honey and to the place of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites. Now therefore, behold, the cry of the children of Israel has come to me, and I have also seen the oppression which is the Egyptians have pressed them. Is it up there? What's the next word? Come now. <laughs> therefore, I will send you to Pharaoh that you may bring my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. Moses had an assignment now. Yeah. It wasn't the promised land. Yeah. It was being obedient to what God had asked him to do. Going to Pharaoh. See, oftentimes we think, because you could get confused if you listen to the first couple of things I said. We get this vision from God and we go, hey, we're just going to kick back. We're going to sit back. We're going to put our feet out. We're going to have some little umbrella cocktails and we're just going to sit back. It's going to be good. And when God is good and ready, when he's on time, it's all going to come to happen. <laughs> There's work to do. There's things to do. We want to receive the promise. We want to sit back and, and, and wait. See, this is the paradox of the Christian faith. Listen to church folks talk. You got planners like me. And then you got... I would say I was in the middle of the road. You guys might not see me that way. I'd say I'm sitting in the middle. But you got people over here that all they want to do is pray about it. And then you got people all the way over here. All they want to do is strategize and figure out how they can do it like that. I think I'm right in the middle because here's why. Here's why. And you can disagree with me if you want to. But I'm all about making a plan. Matter of fact, I think it's a sin not to. But here's the thing. God always has permission to hijack my plan. My plan ain't, my plan ain't the master. But just because God is, that doesn't give me the, the right to step out and not do anything about it. You still got to do your part. See, here, here, we're waiting on God to come do the supernatural. God's waiting on us to do the natural so he can come put the super on it. 
We just get so tired. Because we're sitting in the middle, we get frustrated. Am I talking to anybody right now? You got to take action. Look at Abraham. God came to him. Let me tell you, he was 85 years old. That baby wasn't going to make his cell. That 85-year-old man, he had to go sleep in the tent with Sarah. Like if he's over in another tent, that baby ain't coming. There's only one immaculately conceived baby that I know of. His name is Jesus. But Abraham had to get to work. That might not sound good for church, but it's true. He had to go at it. He had to get to work. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Bless him, Lord. Forgive the pastor. Jesus said, or the Lord said, go be, that's what he told Abraham, go be fruitful and multiply. He, was, he wasn't planting uh, mustard seeds out there. Anyway, let's, let, let's get back on track. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. See, here's the thing. We get our lives and we see these pieces of the puzzle and we go, man, what am I going to do with this? But if we'll take some time, if we'll sit down and we'll start sorting them out and looking at them, hey, this one connects to this one and that one connects to that one. Before long, you know, we'll have the picture that God showed us. Man, I look around this room and I see pieces that God has been piecing together for decades. There's a reason for the piecing together. We got to get to work. We got to do something. Let me, let me give you a, 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 something that I saw happen in December. Well, first of all, anybody know a guy named Nelson Searcy other than Adam in the room? Nelson Searcy's a guy. You've heard of Saddleback Church, right? Nelson seriously came out of Saddleback. He probably left around 2000. He went and planted a church in, in New York City. They have multiple campuses in New York City. They have some Florida campuses. And Nelson seriously is a guy who, he's a strategic guy. Like, I've sat through lots of his seminars. But when they were playing, when 9-11 um, hit, they were a very young church. And this is what I'm talking about, planning. They had planned this outreach nine, ten months earlier and then 9-11 hit and it was right at that time that they were doing this outreach and they were mobilized throughout the city and people were like, how in the world did y'all do this? Because God already had it in the works. God had already knew what was going on. He placed it on their heart. See, God can bless your planning. The Holy Spirit can work in your planning. In December when we were doing our Christmas thing, John was up here on a Saturday in the building and we had these little door knockers that we bought and we were going to hang so we could give them out and hang them on doorknobs. And, and John went over to the Chick-fil-A to begin handing these door knockers out. Guess who was there? The fish. And because... She was ready. Naturally, God came in, put his super on it, did things that we could not have done on our own. We got to trust him. We got to lean into him. We got to do what he asked. We can't get stuck in the crossroads. Anybody know where Abraham came from? Anybody? Anybody? Nobody? They came from the land of Ur, remember? They were coming out of Ur. But Abraham wasn't called from Ur. Anybody know Abraham's father? His name was Terah. Terah was coming out of Ur to Canaan. He was bringing his family to Canaan, and he stopped in Hanan. You know what Hanan is? In the original... Hebrew or Arabic language, it's the crossroads. You know Abraham and not his father because his father stopped in the crossroads going towards what God had called him to. 
What you going to do in the gap? Are you going to complain? Are you just going to trust Jesus for it? And start taking action. Let's pray. Jesus, we love you. We're grateful for you. We're grateful for the call that you have on our lives and moments and times and seasons when it looks like nothing's going on. Help us to realize that you're still going on and you're still there with us. Give us the faith and the courage and the wisdom and the insight to see what it is you're calling us to next. We love you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen, 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 amen. You guys need that word this morning? Yes. All these puzzle pieces are stressing me out. <laughs> well, thank you guys so much uh, for joining us this morning. We're going to dismiss in just a second. Again, a couple of reminders. We've got our um, four-year anniversary celebration coming up in two weeks. We'd love to see you guys here for that. If you have not signed up for a small group yet, please grab that connection card. You can do that before you leave. Drop it in the bucket on your way out. If you've got a prayer request, we want to be able to pray with you. So please fill that out. We'll have prayer leaders down in the front. If you need to talk to somebody, if you've got something going on in your life, and need to process with somebody, we are here and we are available for that this morning. So please do not leave before you do that. Okay, so remember, grab that connection card, fill it out. We want to know what's going on in your life. Sign up for a small group. And then make sure you are here uh, for our four-year anniversary in two weeks. Amen? Amen. All right, I'll pray, and then we'll officially be dismissed. Jesus, we love you. God, we thank you for this morning, Lord. We ask that you would help us to remain faithful in the promise gap in the same way that you have been faithful in the promise gap, God. Lord, help us not to grow weary in the waiting, God, but to, to be reminded, as Chris said for us this morning, that you have work for us to do, God. So I'd help us to uh, remain energized on the inside, God, to, to, to move and to obey and to be a part of what it is that you're doing in this season because we know it's not nothing, God. We know you don't give us a promise and then have nothing for us to do in the meantime, God. So, Lord, help us to be people that uh, look for the opportunities in, in the promise, God. Lord. Be with us, Lord. We honor you. We love you. and We praise you in this place. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 amen, amen, amen. Thank you guys so much for joining us. You are officially dismissed, and we'll see you next week.